scratch and shed, let's hear the voices sing. Let's get behind United and make the rappers ring. We've a team we can be proud of, and Don Revy is the king. As Leeds go marching on. There are few more compelling stories than that of Don Reavy, as he liked to be known. Yes, even the pronunciation of his surname caused controversy. From the day he was born, July the 10th, 1927, in Middlesbrough, Don Reavy always stood out from the crowd. His achievements over 61 vital years have been well chronicled and are now remembered on many a street corner. It's a fitting tribute to him that fans on their way to watch Leeds United, even today, pass Reavy Road. Don first came to prominence with Leicester, only missing the 1949 Cup final through injury. Then later, with Hull City, where he helped the great Rage Carter rejuvenate an ailing club. Perhaps the most memorable of six England caps came during Manchester City days, when Scotland were put to the sword. The capacity crowd are at Wembley to see England, in the white shirts, gain their biggest win ever over Scotland. The hero of the match, Stanley Matthews, toys with his opponents. Having passed, he moves into position to take the return. When he comes, he seems to have all the time in the world to pick the spot for his centre. Matthews again to Revy, who slips it to Lofthouse. He beats his man and with a great drive gets England second. The game's only six minutes old and already England are two up. Nothing can stop Matthews, the incomparable maestro, playing one of his greatest games. And now it's to Revy again. Revy to Lofthouse. But that goes astray and is collected by left-back Haddock, who puts Scotland on the attack. England attack again, and it's a near miss, but there's no one there to follow up. A minute or two later, and Revy makes it three for England. Matthews skips past two players before passing again to his inside partner, Revy, who can't get past Haddock, but Matthews is there and so is his famous sprint. Back the ball comes to Lofthouse and another goal. And England leads at half-time by four goals to one. From the restart, England keep up the pressure. Lofthouse is unable to stop his rush and takes a header over the pressmen. They haven't much to cheer about now. No one would believe he's 40. Over again to Revy. To Wilshaw and another goal. This is Wilshaw's fourth of the match. He's the first man to score four in a big match at Wembley. It seems that everyone is cheering, but it's a sad blow for some. But Scotland never give up and they come back on the attack. Doherty takes a free kick, and it's a goal from 60 yards. A defiant last-minute gesture by a team unlucky enough to have met England and Matthews at their best. That same year, Don Reeves' skills were richly rewarded. He was named Footballer of the Year. His only disappointment to lose his medal in the Cup final against Newcastle. Twelve months later, Reeves and Manchester were back at Wembley, fulfilling a promise to themselves to return victorious. All the talk was of the Reeves plan. Uh, people know, I think we'd call, call it 4-2-4. Uh, it was Ken Barnes and I originally in the middle of the field with four forwards up front and four defenders at the back. Don Revy leads another Manchester attack. Revy, who wasn't in the team till four hours before the kickoff, is proving a tower of strength as centre-forward. His attack gives an opening to Jackie Dyson, who shoots, and it's a goal! The most momentous move in Don Revy's career came in 1958. His transfer to Leeds altered the shape of his entire career. As a footballer, he was the most wanted man in Britain. Four clubs paid £80,000 for his services. In March 1961, he became player-manager to launch one of the most successful and remarkable careers in the history of football management. But the start was less than auspicious. Very grim, yes. Um, we had a chairman called uh, Mr Ball at the time, and then Mr Reynolds took over from him. 
and recommended me to the board of directors to be team manager. He eventually sent, well, well, he sent a letter to Bournemouth recommending me for the player manager job there. This story that you nearly got, you would have got the sack if they hadn't won, uh, if you hadn't won a match at Newcastle at the end of the first season you were there, is that true? Uh, that was possible. Um, I think that you only get uh, one season, and if you take a team down in, uh, to a low division in your first season, and the way the managers are sacked these days, let's be fair, there's 760 odd gone since the war, uh, and there's only 92 jobs in the, <coughs> in the Football League, uh, it's a very dicey game. Within two years of that escape, the Reavy revolution had begun. He steered the club into the first division as champions in 1964. In their first season back in the top flight, Leeds failed only on goal difference to Manchester United to take the league title. They also reached the FA Cup final, but scarcely did themselves justice in losing in extra time to Liverpool. Unfortunately, Liverpool also pipped them for the championship the next year. But at last, in 1968, Leeds silenced their critics on the best stage of all, Wembley. The spell was broken in the Football League Cup final against Arsenal. It started out well enough with some reasonably crisp play. Arsenal made some promising attacks. But any goodwill and skill rapidly turned sour early on when Leeds were awarded a goal. Arsenal said their goalkeeper had been fouled before Terry Cooper cracked the ball home. Should that goal have been allowed? Watch it again from another angle as we stop the film at the vital moment in dispute. Fernell was helpless as the ball went in. The Gunners were convinced the goal should have been disallowed. But referee Hamer ignored their protest. From that moment on, things went from bad to worse. Leeds had a vital one-goal lead. Arsenal were angry and desperate to draw level. This was the result. A shameful free-for-all in the Leeds goal match. With some assistance, the referee managed to regain control. Half-time brought a welcome break in the tension, but the mood was still black on the resumption. Anything was likely to spark off more friction between the two sides. The standard of play suffered badly. This Leeds effort by Bremner came close to bringing about yet another ugly scene. Arsenal attacking. Time was running out. A goal was vital. Samuels came close to getting it, but Sprake kept the ball out. And that was that. It was all over. Leeds had won by a disputed goal. Their supporters were delighted with the result. But nobody could claim it was a great match, even though at least one fan got carried away in his efforts to congratulate the cup winners. Still, the League Cup was on its way home to Leeds. The first major prize for a Yorkshire side in 33 years. As if some great weight had been lifted from their shoulders, Reeves Leeds went on to a second success only weeks later. European football had become a big part of life with Leeds United. Some of the biggest club names of all were toppled by a side fast gaining a reputation to be feared. And Ferenc Varos from Hungary were the ones beaten in the Fairs Cup final. At long last, Leeds had something tangible to show for their astonishing progress under Don Reavy. And the next season, they scaled new peaks in the league. Nice play. Oh, great goal! What a great goal! Echo Grady. Giles, opening up, situation opening up. Chance, that's it! Scorer is Lorimer. West Ham will be in difficulties here trying to cover this. It's a difficult angle to cover. They're trying to form a wall. They've got one, two, three, four, five men in the wall. Only four now. Leeds take it quickly. And it's a goal! Lorimer! Great goal for Leeds United. Hunt with a chance. Oh, he had a chance of a good pass out to Thompson on the right. But Leeds have got it. Bremner, a quick one. It's trouble, Sam. Yes! Jones through! Oh, well taken! That's the final goal for Leeds United. One of the most memorable European nights at Ellen Road came in 1968 when Belgium's standard Liège, two goals up, looked certain winners. 
but had reckoned without the never-say-die spirit instilled by Reeve. Well, I was talking about Standard trying to cool the pace down. They've certainly cooled it down with that goal. Jackie Sheldon! A great goal! And that's 2-1. to 2-1. They need two more goals. Can they get them? We've set our hearts on for eight years now is this league championship and um, it's fantastic when you think that we've played 38 matches only lost two 61 points and Liverpool are still behind us this is something like the coming of a dream isn't it for you looking back over the season what sort of are the highlights for you well the highlights for me are the consistency of the side over the past five or six years they've been very consistent only lose two in the best league in the world out of 38 matches so far is extremely good and I only hope now that they go on and win it for the hard work the players and the staff and everybody's put in the title was eventually secured with six points to spare over liverpool and that record of losing only two matches all season remains unbeaten and what a finale it was at anfield well the memories are living forever that memory because billy bremer took our team when we won the championship to the lead support, there's about 10,000 of them on the left hand side of the ground behind the goal. And then he brought them back to me and I said, Bill, take them to the cop. Oh, I don't fancy that, boss. I said, Go on, take them. So he walked the team and I can see them walking now towards the cop. And the cop, 27,000, went deathly silent and they let him get within six yards with the team of the cop. Then they all started champions and they wouldn't let the players off the pitch for seven minutes. And they'd just lost the championship that night and they roared and roared and oh, it was a tremendous reception we got. To say you were deadly rivals, you had a, a very strange rapport with Liverpool and of course you did as well with Bill Shankly. Yeah, Bill Shankly and I were very close. He used to phone me every Saturday night before match of the day. And he came in the dressing room uh, after that game with all the Liverpool players still in the strip with a bottle of champagne each for our lads. And he gave them all the champagne. He said, Don, can I just have a minute? So I said to the lads, Let, let's be quiet. Mr Shankly wants to say something. And he said, all I've got to say to you, boys, you're a great side and you deserve to win it. You didn't pinch it, you didn't fluke it, you're a wonderful team. Now, coming from Shanks, that was praise indeed. Don Reeve's own reward was the OBE bestowed on him in the 1970 New Year's Honours list. The reward for the Leeds fans in this era, great games, great goals and great players. Giles. Leeds lost that grip they had earlier, but here's Bremner here, Leeds. A good ball, nice ball to Gray. And a goal, a glorious goal, a superbly executed goal. Mick Jones. No Grady. Jack Charlton, Bremner. Oh, beautiful goal! What a superb goal by Bremner! Oh, what a wonderful goal by Bremner! Charlton, for once, not going onto the goal line. Staying on the edge of the penalty area instead. And that one's aimed towards Jack Charlton, though, and he almost got to it with his head, but Mike England, his counterpart, getting there first. Lorimer with a shot and a fine goal by Peter Lorimer. Gray inside is Clark. There's Gray. Oh, good ball to Jones, to Clark. There's Gray. It's there, Eddie Gray. Oh, what a beautifully worked goal. For Maidley. Chris Galvin, out on the left is Hibbert, but Galvin holding it at the moment. Bates trying to get up there, Gray picking it up in midfield. And a good one. It's there, what an incredible goal! What an incredibly judged goal by Eddie Gray! Gray still up there. Eddie Gray. Oh, good footwork by Gray, still going. Oh, what a lovely goal, what a masterly goal by Eddie Gray. A superb bit of football. These players were blessed with sublime skills, none more so than Eddie Gray, whose gem of a goal against Burnley is still frequently shown. The climax to the 1970 season saw Leeds in with a unique chance of three trophies, including the FA Cup final against Chelsea, which went to a replay. And 
Rafinha trying to go in. And a goal by Jones. Cook. Chelsea showing a bit of style now. As Osgood goes in. A goal by Osgood. Peter Osgood. And a beautiful long throw again there by Hutchins and Jack Charlton. And it's there. And it's Webb. Another crushing disappointment, and in the European Cup semi-finals, more woe. Celtic came out best in two titanic battles. 1-0 at Ellen Road, 2-1 at Hampden Park, in front of no fewer than 136,000 spectators. To rub salt into the wounds, those other Merseyside rivals, Everton, took the league championship. But there was glory to be gained the next season, in the old Fairs Cup to be renamed the UEFA Cup the next year. Juventus, the crack Italian team, was the foe in the two-legged final. Leeds drew 2-2 in Turin, and those away goals were to prove vital. When the teams met again in front of a capacity crowd at Ellen Road, Alan Clark virtually assured Reeves' team of a major trophy with his goal beautifully struck. Juventus possessed a team of internationals, but Leeds, roared on by their fanatical followers, loved the great occasion. The Italians did salvage some pride, though, levelling the match on the night. A 1-1 draw, sufficient for Leeds to go on, though, and celebrate a significant triumph in their staggering progress under Don Reavy. Come on, Michael. Come on, in the league championship that year, form like this against Everton put Leeds well in the running for a second title. To Keith Newton, and he's made a gift of it to Jones. And here's Giles. It's there. Giles was equalised. A mistake by Brian Labone. Free kick taken by Cooper. Giles. Headed out to Bremner. A beautiful goal by Bremner. What cool kicking by Bremner. Madeley back to Lorimer. And Bremner is there! Oh, the cool head of this little man. On the final run in, Leeds opened up a one point advantage over Arsenal in a highly controversial match at Ellen Road. Jack Charlton's last minute winning goal was hotly disputed, but Leeds were in the driving seat. Arsenal, though, did have one game in hand and they made it count, beating North London enemy Spurs to record a famous double. And, would you believe it, Brian Clough's Derby County consigned Leeds to second spot again the following season after another tens finish. At least, though, Leeds, bidding themselves for a double this year, had gained some revenge over Arsenal. Made his head. McClintock. Simpson. Cooper reading that all the way. Lorimer's injured in an offside position, he's hurt his back, but that's aimed towards Jones. Jones in on it, and a goal! What an excellent defense! What an appalling defense from the Arsenal defense! One minute for half-time, and Rice brings down Brent. Giles, as Leeds keep the pressure on all the time on this Arsenal defense. Clark's on the outside, but Lorimer's hit one, and a goal! Giles takes it, Madeley, and a goal from Clark. <laughs> Lindsay with the free kick to Thompson, and a foul by Lorimer, not given. Clark, Jones waiting for the pass, and there it is, well timed, and Jones has made it. Yes. I think Saturday's looks very important to us, but I think the double with two matches to go must be on, must be on with a chance. One of the most important weekends then in Leeds United's entire history. The first leg of the double was at Wembley and against, guess who? Yes, the old enemy, Arsenal again. Oh, coming across to cover. Radford's gone on and he wanted it a little quicker probably. Rice, leaving it for Armstrong. Now Leeds are back in some strength, the white shirts, and it's Gray who stops Armstrong. Peter Lorimer now. Clark. A lot of determination there between Clark and McClintock, and it goes for Alan Ball. 
Charlie George losing his way a little. And Maidley to take it up now for Leeds United. A fiercely competitive match and nothing between the two sides. Jones now for Leeds. And McNabb only half stopping him. Jones getting it across. And Clark going in. And Alan Clark has put Leeds ahead. was Mick Jones who made that goal as he does so often unselfishly. Bob McNabb just couldn't stop the cross. Clark comes steaming in there, headed it with his feet on the ground, and there can be no blame attached to Barnett for that header. Powerful, right in the corner, a winner all the way from Alan Clark. The cop already with the white ribbons. Leeds get it for the first time in their history. In centenary year. The cup goes to Billy Bremner and Leeds United. So far, so good. But just when it seemed Billy Bremner and his team had the chance to silence the critics once and for all, they blew it badly. Don Revie could hardly watch as Wolves beat them in the league only 48 hours after Wembley. Three months later, though, he was back with his players, plaguing the lives out of the rest of the country's football clubs. Victory followed victory. There were few more consistent sides anywhere in the world. And when Leeds reached their third cup final in four years and found themselves up against second division Sunderland, there could only be one outcome, couldn't there? A deep one again. Watson is right in there. So too is Hallam. And Porterfield! Oh, Porterfield has scored! And Sunderland, the underdogs, are in the lead. And they stayed in the lead. What an upset. But things were still looking good on the European battlefields. Cherry, a goal! Right through the lot of them. Lorimer, well, Lorimer making no doubt of his intentions unless he's going to fool everybody. Here comes Lorimer. What a save and a goal, Jones. Lorimer did the damage. To their horror, Leeds came up against not only an uncompromising AC Milan in the final in Greece, but also some bizarre refereeing decisions, and they lost 1-0. All these setbacks came as crushing blows to Don Revie, single-minded as he was in his quest to make Leeds the greatest club side in the world. He'd assembled a magnificent squad of players, all destined to be internationals. Their feats will be recorded in soccer's history books. It's not always easy to analyse success, but it was still an intriguing question for the man who'd built a team of footballing giants. You know, they talk about good managers and talk about good coaches. I think if, if you've got good players in your club, then good players make good managers and bad players make bad managers. Because I always used to say, Bill Shank and I, that if we were at Halifax Town and they left us with the same type of players and the no money, we'd have possibly got them organised well and got them super fit, but we'd never won anything because you can't make bad players into good players and you can't make good players into great players. And all these lads that we had at Leeds, about 18, 16 internationals, all had tremendous flair and tremendous talent. And I think they only come together once in a lifetime. Leeds should have won more honours, but the fates were not always kind, and the manager admitted to a superstitious streak, which many saw as a flaw. I had the same blue suit on that I've had since the first match of the season, the same lucky tie, one or two lucky charms in my pocket. I was spotted via, I walk up to the traffic lights every time, and I turn and walk back to the hotel. The men around Reevy were handpicked. Les Cocker, who kept the players in peak condition. Maurice Lindley, whose dossiers on the opposition became legendary. And all this part of the meticulous planning that went into every game. The other vital component in success, the family spirit engendered in the team. Four and three, 43, five and six, 56. Eight and three, 83. Don's family had an important part to play too. Wife Elsie helped him relax away from Ellen Road preferably on the golf course. <laughs> but back at work, Don Revie had a special rapport with his other family. Not bad, no. Hmm? No. Well, we do this every Thursday morning for the last 11 to 12 years. I feel it's been a, a great thing to them because it just relaxes them a little bit and gets the tension out of the muscle before the Saturday match. And we often say that if we had a pound for each one with massage, Bob, <laughs> we'd be wealthy men because we massage them on a Monday before a Wednesday game also. And I think they look forward to it. It's got to play as boss as here now. For me, that only happens once in a lifetime. I think Leeds United, probably when 
all of us are finished. They'll, they'll probably have a good team, but they'll, they'll not have a great team. This only happens for me once in a lifetime. Yeah. To have, uh, what, 18 internationals on your side in this squad can't be a bad at all. I don't think there's any other, any other club in the country can boast that. And they're all under one roof at the same time. Match day. The week's work comes to fruition, and it's a day of total commitment. The 1973-4 season was to be Don's last with the club, though he didn't know it when the season got underway. Like all seasons, it had its ups and downs, its highs and lows, and its magic moments. The referee saying play on, he may well have been fouled, but the referee playing the advantage rule, Brent McCullough, Lorimer. Go, what a goal! No wonder teams dreaded coming to Ellen Road. There was a story, you know, that uh, Mike Doyle, when I took over the England job, and he was in my squad, he told me a story the first week that he joined the, the, when I had the England team. He said, we'd be in the bath at Main Road at Manchester City, and they had a good side at the time, Lee and someone being all that crowd. He said, we'd all be singing, we'd wonder on three or four nothing, and somebody said, oh, do we play next week? Lee's at Ellen Road. They said, the bath used to go deathly silent. <laughs> Didn't like going Ellen Road. <laughs> so, Madeley using that stride of his again. Jones. Clark. Mainly, Bates couldn't get out of the way. Jones, Bates. Go! Mick Bates. Throw to West Ham United and Bobby Moore once again having to lift his side from beneath. It's an unfortunately familiar habit for the Hammers this season now. Bad pass sets Jones up. Lorimer's outside him. That's for Lorimer at the angle. Clark in the penalty. Yeah, Jones! Number two! chasing, he's done it I think, yes he has, that's three, beautifully taken by Jones. Mainly. Hunter. Cherry now going forward for Leeds, on the left is Bates. Plenty of men in the middle. Clark. Oh! A model ahead of I. Clark. And once again, Day left standing. Hunter for Maidley. Searching for Clark. Bates early for Giles. Lorimer under this. It's a good ball, Jones! Yes, indeed. Mick Jones pulls one back. So, an awkward free kick for the Leicester defenders again. Giles through, Bremner. And he's allowed it. He is allowed the goal. It's 2-2 and Bremner scored it. And by the end of it all, fittingly, the Dons' last season with the club was crowned with the league championship. Leeds' second league title, though, the prelude to a bombshell for the club. In July 1974, Don Revie tipped to be the next manager of England, and the pundits got it right. His phenomenal record at Ellen Road had made him the obvious candidate for the job vacated by Sir Alf Ramsey. Under Revie, Leeds enjoyed the most sustained period of success in their history. Two league championships, the FA Cup, the Football League Cup and two European Fairs Cups. On July the 20th, Leeds appointed their successor to Revie, none other than Brian Clough, a staggering choice. In view of the fact only days earlier, he'd suggested Leeds should be relegated to the third division and called some of their players cheats. His first training session aroused curiosity, but he was sacked by the time the new chapter in Don Revie's life got off to an exciting start. This was when Czechoslovakia were beaten at Wembley in the European Championships. It was the perfect beginning for Revy. No Bremner or Giles, but he did have new names, inherited heroes like Mike Shannon. Shannon to be involved in the second of the night's goals. A run down the left. 
Support through the middle. But the finish from Colin Bell. A player often coveted by Reevy during his club days. Bell, of course, from Manchester City. But now Reevy had charge of England and players like Kevin Keegan and Trevor Brooking. And they'd not finished on this night. There was a third goal to come as well. Keegan involved. And Bell. Shannon again. And Bell's second of the night. Soon afterwards, the powerful West Germans were also to be vanquished at Wembley. Reevy's colossal influence on players was paying off. down for Shannon. Challenge from behind, which is unfair. And the free kick already taken, and here's Ball now. With the cross, as McDonald comes in, yes! Out of McDonald, number two! Well, a shot there of Beckenbauer looking a little harassed. And Bell, and Watson with the header! Oh, out of the way by Benny Vogt! So what made Don Reavy so special to the men who played for him? Oh, he's a tremendous players manager. I think one of the biggest problems is he's been misunderstood a lot by the press, but uh, I suppose, to be fair, he only ever really cared about the players. So to play for him was a tremendous privilege. He gave, he gave you a confidence, he was a great motivator, and he had a tremendous pride and passion for the game, and that carried through, you know, to, he could carry it through to certain players, easier than others, and I think, certainly from my point of view, I can say he made me feel even more proud than I was to pull an England shirt, you know, which I didn't think was possible. He had this tremendous way of saying, hey, this is your country, you're the best in the country, those people have paid money to see you, you know, come on, don't let them down, you know, and that was a tremendous uh, motivator. Rounding off a magnificent first season in charge, Reevy then saw his team, inspired by his new captain, Jerry Francis, destroy the oldest enemy of all, Scotland. Johnson, Francis, Shannon, Francis again. Oh, he's shaken off Jardine there. And that's a good shot. Who's oh, there? Jerry Francis. Oh, Jerry Francis, a beautiful goal. It's with Alfie Conn now for Scotland. Now Francis. Chipping it forward to Ball. Back again to Francis. It'll give England a lot of confidence, that goal. And it's showing there as Keegan takes it up. And Beatty is the only man up with him. Of all people, the fullback. The chip comes in towards Beatty. And it's there again! 2-0! Two, Two goals in the first six minutes! And Kevin Beatty! And Kennedy can't believe it! Ball. Watson. Flick for Bell. A little chip this time for Francis. Ball away on the left for him, so is Beatty. Number three, Beatty. Francis. Shannon. Francis again. Several good passes now by England. Colin Bell. Still with Colin Bell. Oh, number three by Bell! Watson away up here on the right in case the, uh, they should try a long one. Well, they did try it again. And it came off! And it's a goal by Francis! John Revy shouting away his orders, but I would think it's unlikely that he'll make any substitutions now. Con, Hutchison and McGrain, just Hutchison and McGrain in that wall, played towards the near post, oh, hit onto the crossbar, and then Watson didn't get it in, and Johnson did! David Johnson, 5-1 to England. Despite all this success, not all sections of the media were happy with Reeve's approach to the job, and that made him bristle especially when England failed to reach the European finals. Well, I feel that um, a big loss was uh, Jerry Francis in the middle of the field, but um, no excuses. Um, I was let the side that I think will do well. Um, everybody's tried to pick the team and ram a thousand players down with throat, um, yourself and, and Jimmy Earl and managers and many people, uh, many managers. Um, I haven't hit back at them, but um, a lot of the managers who were talking have never won a trophy yet.
Um, and when they start winning something and doing something at their own clubs, then they can criticise me. But I think it's part of the England manager's job to be criticised by the public, the press, the television. Um, but I'm one that I've always made up my own mind about situations and players and teams. And I will continue to do that because I think if you start listening to everybody in sight, you don't know where you are. The problems began to mount for Rivi when Italy virtually killed off our World Cup aspirations in Rome. Two clinically struck goals were just the ammunition those who wanted him out of the England post needed to launch a campaign for his head. England's players would not be going to the finals in West Germany and as always the man to bear the brunt of the failure was the manager. Yet had Don Reavy really been such a flop in the job? On paper, the record didn't look at all bad. 29 games played, 14 won, 8 drawn, only 7 lost. But then, the next thunderbolt in this turbulent career, as the papers screamed out on the morning of July the 11th, 1977, three years and one week after taking over, Reavy resigned as the England manager. He told the Daily Mail in an exclusive interview, I sat down with my wife Elsie one night and we agreed the job was no longer worth the aggravation. It was bringing too much heartache to those nearest to us. Nearly everyone in the country seems to want me out, so I'm giving them what they want. I know people will accuse me of running away and it does sicken me that I can't finish the job by taking England to the World Cup finals in Argentina next year. But the situation has become impossible. The following morning, those words about running away took on even more meaning when Reavy announced he was to work in the United Arab Emirates. The press slaughtered him. Subsequently, the Football Association accused Reavy of bringing the game into disrepute. He was suspended from working in English football until willing to face the charge. That didn't happen for some time. But Reavy won his High Court appeal and he told Richard Whiteley on YTV a few days later, given his time over again, he'd have handled things differently. I was totally wrong when I look back and I would do it all differently if, um, if I was going to do it again. But I felt that I would have got the sack, um, although we only lost six out of about 30 matches with England team when I was there for three years. Uh, I never got on with Saddle Thompson, which is a known fact um, throughout the country. And I felt like that I would have got the sack after the Italian game and the qualifying games for the World Cup. Um, and I got this offer from, from Dubai, uh, from the Emirates, and I decided to take it. As when I look back at Alf Ramsey's record, he only lost about 11 matches in 10 years at 116 and won the World Cup in 1966. And one bad result against Poland that night at Wembley in the qualifying games again when I took over in 74, and he was sacked. Yeah. But so that... I thought, well, if I get the sack and the, that job's not there anymore, um, I'd have possibly got another job in England or elsewhere. Uh, but the offer I got was so good that I got to take it. Never again did Don Reavy involve himself in the professional game other than in an advisory capacity. He ploughed his vast knowledge back into football through soccer schools for youngsters like the Yorkshire Television Soccer Academy and found willing allies in many of his former players at club and international level. I think outside of uh, Bill Shankly, I, I would say he's a very close second to Bill Shankly and in my life, you know, that, that is the highest accolade I can give anyone. There were two fantastic managers which I was privileged to play for. It was during one of his visits to the soccer school in Leeds that Don Reavy broke the most shattering news of all to me, that he was suffering from the killer disease, motor neurone. Nobody knows very much about it here, but in America they've got a scheme where they can put you on a three-year plan there, but you've got to be an American citizen. And they've found a drug that over a three-year period and exercise and certain things, they can stop it completely. They can't cure it a lot, but they can stop it. Um, but you've got to be an American citizen, and I'd have to wait six years, uh, which would be possibly far too long and too late. So I've just got to do the exercise and the treatment that they say so and uh, see what happens over the next few months. Do you have to have assistance? You were saying earlier about... You well, know, you've seen, John, I'm, walk, I'm walking with a stick, um, and I try not to have assistance because I think I've got to try and fight it. Um, or do all the things they've told me to do, but getting in and out of cars and walking, you see me walking today and getting in and out of chairs and things, is not an easy, easy job. But you can either lie down to it, as the specialist told me in, in uh, Houston, he said, well, Don, you can have pity parties all your life, and you'll find at the end of all the pity parties, you'll only be the one left at the pity party by yourself. He said, oh, you can get up and, and fight it and have a go at it, and that's what I intend to do. That fighting spirit, that indomitable will to conquer the opposition never waned, 
but the crippling disease which had also claimed actor David Niven was soon having a marked effect, and so it was that at a game played in Don Reeve's honour at Ellen Road, the proceeds to go to motor neurone research, all his sons, as he still loved to call them, were there to pay their own tributes. The greatest quality he had was his man management, because he had under his roof about 18 full internationals, and he knew how to uh, handle us all and get the best out of each other. And he created a marvellous atmosphere at the club. Good players, good manager, and it was a pleasure to be here. Coming over to, to you, Jack, I'm sure you didn't always agree with him, but I'm sure you learned a bit from him as well. No, no, his man management, I was just thinking when he was always on, because Don used to go. On a Friday, he'd come and put his arm around you and that meant you weren't playing. <laughs> <laughs> he is Leeds United because he's... When he was here, it, was, it didn't matter if he was here, uh, actually, at the ground. He could be in Scotland, but he was here. His presence was always here. I had a job to keep the tears back, but I did. And uh, it's very kind of all these players who've travelled thousands of miles to be here. And for Billy and all these players to do a good job for me. I think it's a good crowd turned out. And uh, everybody's been very kind. It was a poignant and emotional farewell. Don Reavy was never again to see Ellen Road or Leeds United, the club that he built from almost nothing. He died on May the 26th, a mere 61. Although they knew the end had been coming, the men he made into stars were deeply shocked. I would say he's the best club manager ever played for. Um, he was Leeds United to all the, uh, the great team that we had, all those players, and I include the squad of players. He, he was Leeds United. He looked after all the players, not just the players, but the families as well. He was a great man and a great manager. The funeral service in Scotland was attended by old players and the fans who simply wanted to pay their last respects. Later, a memorial service was also held in Leeds, the city that will always be synonymous with a great man and a great manager who didn't lose many matches, but in the end lost the greatest fight of his life. In these last years, he suffered the gradual helplessness and indignity of an incurable disease. It was the game he couldn't win. Uh, we had no words before the game, but after a hard contest, which we always had with Leeds, of course, uh, then it was all smiles, congratulations, or hard luck, whichever the case may be. A drink and a way home. Everybody says part of the family. What did it mean in reality? It meant you had 15, 20, Brothers, what it meant. He's like a father to me, you know, and he saved my England career. He was a great manager. I just think he was very unfortunate we just didn't have any good players. As simple as that. If the players had been good enough, he would have probably been as great a success as Alf Ramsey. We remember him with pride, with thankfulness, with affection. Don Revy of Leeds and England. The memories that you can't take away from you, John. And in my little snug at home, where I've got the television, the video, and all my tapes of all the matches and sport, I've got all the players and photographs that matter to me, like Mab Busby, Jock Steen, Shanks, the championship winning team, the cup final team. And it's nice memories to have around about you. <laughs>